welcome back, listeners, to So Very Wrong About Games. Today, sponsored by Salt. Mmm, Salt. And I'm here with my good friend, Mark. How are you today, Mark? I'm very well, thanks. How are you? Always good. We are a podcast that talks about board games. First, we are going to talk about games we played this week, then the news and why it doesn't matter, and then our feature game of the week, which is Botoku. Mark, what did you play this week? I played the Quest for El Dorado, the Golden Temples. This is Reiner Knizia's deck building game. This is actually the sequel to the Quest for El Dorado, and I really think the Golden Temples is the best way to play. I will happily play the Quest for El Dorado in any combination, but of the two expansions to the base game, there is Heroes and Hexes, which I think is kind of wonky. I recommend avoiding it, and then there's the Golden Temples, which is my preferred way. And I played two-player for the first time playing the Golden Temples, and the two-player mode really leverages some of the structural advantages that the Golden Temples introduces, because when you're playing with two players, you have two different explorers, and both explorers have to reach whatever goal you have. In the base game of the Quest for Eldorado, it's just a race. You start at one end of the board and you progress to the other end of the board. But in the Golden Temples, you have to go and fetch these gems and then go back to usually someplace pretty close to the beginning. And as a result, you actually get to make some decisions about how to split up your two explorers. And you can even have some situations where your deck is not specialized, but you only use movement cards for some explorers some of the time. And so in effect, you can have some degree of specialization, or indeed a safety valve, six of one, half a dozen the other in the context of the Quest for Eldorado, the Golden Temples. I thoroughly enjoy the game. I really enjoyed it two-player, which as I said, it was the first time. And it also had a lovely bit of drama. Normally in deck builders, you don't really have a, a, a conclusive end. But one of the benefits of the structure of a race game like the Quest for Eldorado is you actually have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and you actually have some tangible thing you're seeking to accomplish. And in this case, there was a dramatic come-from-behind victory, which is always pleasing. And the crowd went wild. Not that there was any crowd, because we're board gamers and we have no friends. But I continue to go back to the quest for El Dorado. Reiner Knizia really, really, really did deck building very well, I think. And the Golden Temples is my preferred configuration. Although, by all means, use the material from the base game to make truly large maps. Even a huge map of the quest for El Dorado will not take you very long. It is a very, very quick and approachable game. Highly recommended. Quest for El Dorado, the Golden Temples. So you said with two player, they both the explorers had to come back, but they could go in different directions. Absolutely, that's the same as in the base game. You have two explorers, and they they both have to finish the race. But given the more distributed layout of the Golden Temples, where you can go to different destinations, in this particular case, I had one of my explorers do rather a lot of the heavy lifting. And it just because that's how my deck shook out. There was this water to the south, and I didn't have much water cards. And so one of my explorers went south, and when I had the water cards, that tended to be when that explorer moved, as opposed to the rest of my deck, which was highly focused on churning through lots of coins and torch cards. And so my other explorer went to the two more distant temples, grabbed those two gems, and then went back home. So, so one went on a nice whitewater rafting tour, while the other one... Did all the business. Gotcha. There was business. Oh, it was business time. I got to play Copenhagen. This is put out by Queen Games. I don't know what else to say about that, Mark. <laughs> and we're done. Because <laughs> literally, like, like, this is one of the reasons, like, why? Why? <laughs> like, you, you, you pick cards, and then you buy tiles, and you put the tiles in place. Copenhagen. <laughs> this is something that they printed. <laughs> This is much like another game we were talking about recently where they they throw in some special powers. Might Like uh, the same thing we're talking about with uh, Seven Wonders Architects where there's these special abilities up in the court you might buy. They might spice up the game or make it a game, but they don't really. I'm just not sure about this game. If you really like <laughs> Tetromino games, then you might find something in here. I did not. You, If you line up the windows, then you get some bonuses, but it's literally – you know, uh, ticket to ride style, pick two cards that are beside each other from the, from the tableau. And then as soon as you got enough cards to buy a Tetromino piece, you buy it and then you place it in your building. And that's all you do. Did not like it. Would not play again. Would not recommend Copenhagen. The end. I get to return to Imperium Classics and Imperium Legends, again, with a deck building leveraged in a somewhat novel way. This was by Nigel Buckle and David Surte. We reviewed it when it came out. 
initially published by Osprey Games, and I still enjoy returning to it. I actually recorded an editorial uh, for the patrons talking about the theming of Civilization games. And, and basically, to sum up, Civilization games often fall into one of two categories. There's the more common category in the Sid Meier mold, whereby you have, you know, Caesar as some kind of immortal god king. And it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. You end up with a pastiche of a variety of cultural elements. And there's just a sense of dissociation. And I feel like it's just ticking off a whole bunch of boxes of historical figures and events, completely bereft of any context or meaning. And then you have the more zoomed out lens of a more Tresham mold, which I prefer. But as a result, you lose a lot of the personality. You know, if you're going to be leading th- leading the Romans over the course of 6,000 years of prehistory and then history, you're not really going to be able to get to know any of them by name, perforce. And I find that Imperium Classics does an excellent job of squaring the circle. You have people like Pericles, like Ramses, or Caesar, or what have you. They show up, they do their thing, they're consequential, and then they're dead. And this is represented in the specific case of Imperium as a card going into your history. Which is to say, they're gone, they're out of your deck, but they are going to score at the end of the game. And managing what goes into your history and when is another element that is very straightforward, but nonetheless allows you to shovel in a lot of good civilization and historical theming into what is otherwise a comparatively abstracted deck builder. And the other thing that I really, really appreciate more and more as I go back to Imperium Classics and Imperium Legends is the artwork. I get to lo- marvel at the lovely little tableaus of various events. I, I was playing the Greeks, and I really do like the card art for the Olympics, actually. Uh, the Olympics are currently going on. Uh, they are a corrupt sham. They ought to be abolished. Uh, but the first Olympics uh, back in the day was great, r- seeing those running naked dudes all over the place. It was a lovely scene and a lovely bit of card art, and the Miko, who did all the card art for all the different civilizations, has injected a fair bit of personality into a lot of the different cards. And it's one of the things that you can look at while waiting for your opponent to finish their turn, because it is almost exclusively multiplayer solitaire. Now, that is not a virtue in games, but sometimes I'm willing to forgive it. And in the case of Imperium, I do enjoy the theming, I enjoy the artwork, I also enjoy it mechanically. And so I'm more than happy to go back to it. Imperium Classics and Imperium Legends published by Osprey Games last year by Nigel Buckle and David Zertze. I returned to Chita Sato. This is designed by Simone Suturi-Sola and put out by Gochix Italian. So this is a great bag-building game where the first turn is one cube, two cubes, and three cubes. So you can you can really plan out your turn. And it's a locked economy. I talked about this last week already, but we got to play with more players. If you want to see us play it, it's on our live channel on YouTube. And... I just loved how it turned out with more players. Cards were disappearing faster. There was a lot more push to get those cards. People were burning them because you can either play them or burn them to your board. And every color of card has uh, stepping up special abilities when you burn them, like the first, first, second, and third. And they get more powerful as you go. And then you're sort of building your deck for this interesting endgame scoring because you have two different score markers, one for during the game, and then at the end of the game, you get to play one card per color. So while you're playing the game, you're trying to build this tableau of, or I shouldn't say tableau, I guess hand of, uh, of one card of hopefully of each color that, that it's going to get you victory points somehow. Because at the end of the game, you play them out and you try to either, you know, go past your original score marker or, or get close enough to it because you have to pay the penalty that's in between with crowns. And if you can't, then you're playing your lower crown. Uh, and I also talked about this sort of swinging political thing on the top of your board that you have to plant in, that you have to get your token in at the end of the game or else you're definitely scoring your lower one in three player game that was swinging back and forth a lot more than usual. So I'm so glad I returned it with more players. This is a game I think I'm going to keep for a while because I really want to introduce more people to it because it does a lot of things differently that no other game does. Well, you know, there's not, there are a few bag builders now, but the bag building, the actions, the two phase scoring, the, the fact when you're spending the cubes, there's so many different things you can do. Like either there's like uh, decisions to make, right? Because you're upgrading your board. I'm not going to, I don't want to say Hansa Teutonica because it doesn't play anything like it except for that feeling when you're cashing in uh, one of the roots to improve your board. I see. It's the same sort of thing. I'm spending these cubes. Do I want to do the action or do I want to spend the cubes to upgrade that action so the next time I do it, it'll be more powerful? So that part is exactly that feeling. So I, this is what I love about it. 
And then it has, like I said, because it's closed for the colored cubes, the way you get the black and white ones is improving your board. So you're introducing the black and white cubes to your bag, lets you do more things. I like everything about it. I can't wait to show it to you. It sounds really good. I can't wait to try it. I hope you like it. That is Cheetah Sato. I got to play Caesar. Seize Rome in 20 minutes with the attendant exclamation points. This is by Paolo Mori. Paolo Mori is one of my favorite designers. And because I think that Paolo will never know how much I love him, never know how much I care, I have composed an original song in his honor. When he puts his arms around me, I get a Caesar that is hard to bear. He gives me Caesar when he kisses me. Caesar when he holds me tight. Caesar! Well, I've seen you in that sparkly red dress, Mark. Fairly impressive. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. So, Caesar sees Rome in 20 minutes. This is nominally a development of Blitzkrieg World War II in 20 minutes, and it itself was a development of Dogs of War, a multiplayer worker placement game. And you can clearly trace the through line through all the games, but nonetheless it's impressive how we've ended up in a situation where Caesar, you can see the similarities with Blitzkrieg, and Blitzkrieg, you can see the similarities with Dogs of War, but when you put Caesar and Dogs of War next to each other, they don't really look all that similar, which I find a very interesting development. And I love watching designers iterate, Paolo Mori being one of our favorite designers. It's a special joy to watch him uh, iterate. Uh, That having been said, I I do think that Caesar, although enjoyable, and I've played it around four times because 20 minutes is a bit of an exaggeration. If anything, it's closer to 10 minutes, is probably the weakest of the three. And here's why. Unlike both Dogs of War and Blitzkrieg, which were about marshalling your forces, knowing where you needed to press, knowing when you could take a step back, managing tempo, worrying about which fronts you needed to focus on now versus the ones you could delay until later, Caesar is more about a fundamental gambit of hoping your opponent doesn't have a tile of the right suit in order to play, because... There are all these provinces representing the Roman Empire at the time. Well, proto-Roman Empire, there was still a republic, I suppose. And whoever finishes the province, whoever places the last tile around the province, gets a bonus tile. And then you determine who has the most strength in that province. And that player gets to place their influence, which is how you win the game. If you can do both at the same time, which is a very, very difficult thing to do, you get a very large bonus. And sometimes it's an incredibly game-swinging bonus. And as a result, sometimes you're in a position where you have to decide where to play based almost exclusively on what your opponent has in their hand. What this makes me feel like I have to do is, like, I have to look at the board and make some sort of tally and calculation about what pieces they have and what they've already drawn in their bag and what the odds are therefore that they'll have the necessary suit. And this isn't the kind of calculation that I necessarily enjoy, especially in a game of about 10 minutes. And it's not the kind of risk taking that I think is organic to a two player game. It's not about what my decision is going to, what my opponent is going to choose to do. It's about what resources literally they have access to by virtue of a random pull. And that isn't ideal. So it's an interesting variation on the theme, but not one that I necessarily appreciate in the same way. That having been said, as I mentioned, it is very different from Blitzkrieg in a number of ways. Uh, For one thing, it feels a lot more like a positional abstract than Blitzkrieg did. Blitzkrieg wasn't exactly the most tightly themed thing in the world, but by virtue of the geography of the game of Caesar, Caesar Roman 20 Minutes, it feels a lot more like an abstract. For example, in Blitzkrieg, whether two fronts were adjacent or not didn't matter a whole heck of a lot. But in Caesar, if two provinces are adjacent and you win them both, well, that gives you an extra victory point, essentially. And that can be massive, and it can be part of, as I said, some of these cascading combo effects that make a significant consequence about how the game works. And again, one of the reasons why the game is so quick. So it's a fascinating design, a lovely little bit of work, but the key gambits, the key risks, uh, I'm not playing to the strength of the design for me and for my taste in the same way that Blitzkrieg or indeed Dogs of War did. But I'm very happy to try it, and I thoroughly recommend it to anybody who's a fan of Paolo Mori and his recent work. That is Caesar. Caesar Rome in 20 minutes. The exclamation points are obnoxious, but they at least help you find it in the Board Game Geek database, which is very helpful because, as you might imagine, Walker, there are one or two games with the word Caesar in it. Or three. M- maybe three. Maybe three. Maybe three. I got to return to Petrichor by David 
Chirkop and put out by Ape Games. Now, Petrichor is a very interesting game, one of these things that is sort of outside the box of zombies, Vikings, and or trading in the Mediterranean. You're playing these, I shouldn't say playing the clouds, but you're manipulating clouds. You're filling clouds with raindrops and you're, and it's sort of a, a puzzle game because there's this grid of tiles and they all, uh, interact in different ways. They all, they all need different ways for them to engage in scoring and they all need different raindrops on them and you can't score them unless you drop your raindrops out of your clouds. So you're playing cards, one card for the first action, two cards for the second action, and you're populating these clouds. You're trying to rain down on, on these different fields to score points, to engage their scoring mechanisms. And then after every turn, you're voting on these weather patterns on the other sideboard. And then once everyone has depleted their hands, you're going to either do a scoring round, depending if, you know, a certain, certain dice that get manipulated during the turn are all showing a certain symbol, then you're doing scoring. Otherwise, you're just going through the different weather seasons and whatever two got the most votes are going to manipulate the board even further. Either you're like doubling raindrops in a cloud or they're all going to turn to storm clouds or, you know, uh, raindrops are going to be blown up, you know, to different tile pieces. I played this several times before. Loved it even more because we've got like the deluxe version now where the clouds actually have like stems and they're like floating above the board and you That's fill adorable. them with, you fill them with your little beads and very interesting game. I think I would play it anytime just because there's so many different tiles that you can put out. And like I said, they all have different ways in which they, uh, can be engaged in scoring and or move stuff around the board. Love it. The only, th- once in a while, I really feel like, man, wouldn't this game be really cool if it had a windmill? And guess what? Our <laughs> very own warm boy, up and coming designer has made an official expansion that was in the deluxe, deluxe set that has a windmill, windmill and does stuff. So that's kind of cool. And that is Petrichor, the rain game. You, you probably shouldn't say it's official if it's not official, Walker. It is official. It came in the deluxe edition. Oh my edition. goodness. Oh yeah, I don't know. It's in the rule book. His name is in the deluxe rule book. It is an actual well, expansion in the well, deluxe Congratulations, version. Warm So maybe boy. you should just step back and give the man his rightful due. Maybe <laughs> I should check myself. <laughs> That's right. Before I embarrass myself on an award eligible podcast. That's right. And that also can be seen on our live channels. Speaking of live channels, we also streamed Merlin this week. Merlin is another Stefan Feld game. And Mark, you're going to be surprised. You go around a circle and you do uh-huh. the action that you land on. You don't I know say. this is way out of Steffenfeld's wheelhouse, but this is what you do. Wheelhouse. And I see what you did there. Uh, <laughs> and this is by Queen Games. And this is what I really thought when I read the rules. I like. I said, like, really? You pick a die and, and you and you move and you do the action that you land on. But in the end, it does flush out to being much more because you have these three dice that are your color, one die that is the Merlin color. And only if you choose one of your dice, your piece can only go clockwise. If you choose the Merlin die, then you can move Merlin. He can go counterclockwise or clockwise. There are these kingdom spaces, every four spaces around the board. And then when you land on those, you have a plethora of other actions you can do with your little henchmen. And so there's these decision spaces of knocking other people's henchmen out, knowing where to, you know, leave your henchmen. And it's very much, at least the game that we played, this is the first time I ever played Merlin. I remember years ago when it came out, I've always wanted to try it because it got medium buzz. So I wanted to try it. But the game we played was very much yet another Ticket to Ride game where there is this deck of cards, cards, which very much seemed like the majority of the game is you're trying to constantly score these cards. And, uh, it was one player constantly playing one every turn because he kept drawing cards that he just, you know, fell into type thing. And the rest of us just sort of, you know, trying to catch up, but all in all, I still had fun playing it. I would definitely play it again. There's, it's one of these queen games that has a big box. So there's like a ton of module expansions that you can add to do even more stuff. There is uh, traders attacking you and you need shields to block them. There are banner special abilities that you can pick up. All sorts of interesting things that are going on. If you have a chance to play Merlin, I would give it a give it a try. Walker, we were supposed to play Bonfire and we didn't. We will soon, Mark. I promise. You made us play Boon Lake instead. 
I I am deeply regretting this, Mark, myself. I cannot believe you're making me relive Boone Lake. Yeah. Just a second. We, I just wait. We all have I to live with our the, bad decisions. The tremors to slow down just a moment. Okay. Okay. I've once again blocked out Boone Lake. <laughs> I got to try a game called Cleos. Cleos is by Jim Cavanaugh and Azure Horizon Games. He crowdfunded it last year through Kickstarter. And this is a sort of Greek mythology themed within striking distance of a troops on a map game. But it's mostly about card play and leveraging special powers. There's some area majority scoring, but mostly you're going to be getting uh, points from kills and from wild and crazy card effects. You pick a Greek god, they all have their own deck. You're going to be drawing a little bit from your own incredibly overpowered deck, but also from the generic shared deck, which is less powerful, and laughing and marveling at the incredibly weird effects that your opponents are able to pull on you. There's a lot of take that in a game of Cleos. It shakes out to be pretty enjoyable. I, 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 It was some good stupid fun, and I don't mean stupid here in a pejorative sense. I meant stupid in the best possible way. Like... At one point, I had Jason of Jason the Argonauts f- fame riding a chimera. Like, that's just great. If you can't appreciate that as as kind of some stupidity, then that's wonderful. At one point, one of my opponents uh, fed Andromeda to a dragon, uh, and that made the dragon more powerful. Also, very choice. It was- Lots of wild things happening. As somebody who appreciates Greek mythology, even if it's just for window dressing, I very much thought it was great because it wasn't just window dressing. The effects were, you know, roughly consonant with what you might expect the various monsters and heroes and units to be able to do. Now, it actually reminded me a fair bit of Imperium the Contention, the sci-fi card game that sort of is kind of almost a 4 x type of thing, but really not at all. In that, it's mostly about card effects and leveraging special powers that you're going to get from your cards and with a little bit of territory control layered on top of it. Unfortunately, though, where Kleos kind of takes a step back from me and nonetheless finds itself rooted in the cute but stupid category, again, not necessarily strictly a pejorative, is that it has some rather pronounced turn order issues and you're only going to be playing five rounds. Sometimes you desperately want to be first because you want to be able to get that kill, get that unit, get access to that thing. And in, uh, say, a three-player game, which is how we played, in five rounds, obviously, for one thing, that doesn't divide very well. And furthermore, you're not going to have the effects of the advantage of being first player or of sometimes being last player are not really going to have a chance to smooth out given that parsimony of rounds. In Imperium the Contention or another game like that, you have so many rounds where the scepter is being passed around, you usually can wait a couple of turns to mount your big offensive to be able to take advantage of the turn order when you need to. Cleos, not so much. It's true. City State has that same problem because as I talked about, it's, you know, you're, you're spending the blocks to take actions and it's a closed economy. So you can pretty well work out from that, that everyone's taking almost the exact number, same number of turns and whoever passes first is going to be the first player for the next round. So as you can see, Hmm. the first turn marker did not move for like the first six of seven rounds. It was, it's a very odd mechanism. Oh, that's unfortunate. Yeah, if you're going to have a small number of rounds, and if turn order is going to be very consequential, you have a number of unpleasant decisions to make. And it's a pretty big design challenge, and so I don't re- I'm not really surprised that Cleos doesn't really address it. But as I say, if you want a Greek mythology-themed slugfest, where you're just taking a variety of figures from mythology and bashing them against each other, you know, if you want to see Heracles uh, whap Theseus upside his stupid head... Uh, this is absolutely a game worth looking, uh, checking out. I would happily play it again. I don't necessarily know that it has many um, many legs, and I don't think it's the kind of game I could take very seriously. And if you are going to play it, I do encourage you to get in the mindset that there are going to be wild take-that cards. You know, very much in the tradition of, well, I played this awesome unit, and I've upgraded this unit to the nines, and they're just about to go and, oh, it got stolen by Athena. Okay, I guess it's not my unit anymore. And stuff of that nature. Again, in the right mindset, when I'm in the right mood, Cleos is exactly the kind of thing that I'd be down for. But I don't think it's as solid or robust as other typical things. Again, the most recent example probably being Imperium the Contention. So that was Cleos by Jim Cavanaugh. Lastly for me, I'm going to talk about Vampire the Masquerade Vendetta. I don't know how this keeps falling off my list because we've played it several times. We've even streamed it. But I suppose I've always just cut it off at the end because 
it's a game that's just not quite for me. It is yet another sort of Blood Bowl team manager smash up type game where you're having a number of locations out on the board, depending on the number of players. And you're playing vampires to these locations with tons of take that surprise actions that they're doing. Uh, it does do some interesting things where you start the game with two cards and your deck slowly, you know, you get one card a turn. So as you go through your, your hand gets a little bigger, but that means constantly you're going to be having, so you get to know most of the cards that the people have, but they're always going to have that one card that, you know, that you will have no idea that's going to be coming because there's seven different factions that you, that, that are, that are in the game. And I can't see any way of you knowing what cards are going to come up. You could even play, uh, actions to locations face down to even, you know, even more, not have any idea what's going to happen. You get to get to play blood to increase your strength. There's a lot of other things that are, that it does very well. And I can see where, uh, fighting deck people would love this type of game. People who are in that, in that sort of, uh, like that, theme a lot that's why i bought it as a gift for for dewey he was right in he's right into vampire the masquerade he loves it if you like that type of thing it's definitely a game to try out the artwork and the theming is fantastic but once again just not quite a game for me i am shocked to hear that a game designed by bruno faduti has some chaos in it I, it does and it's also designed by charlie cleveland just to make be to be clear and published by horrible guild and those are the games we played last week. Now, on to the news and why it doesn't matter. So, Scorpion Masque is a French-Canadian publisher. They put out Decrypto and a bunch of other games. They're coming out with another game in the sort of social deduction-ish, or at least collective cooperative deduction. It's social in the sense that it's a social-level game, not social in the sense of hidden roles, called Turing Machine. And it involves some weird text about Alan Turing talking about his work on the Enigma device, which has nothing to do with what a Turing machine is. Uh, I hope at least they're going to mention in this game how he was persecuted for his sexuality and that we need to remember that his war contributions were entirely covered up because the British government was embarrassed about him. And I think that if you're going to name a, a game after Alan Turing, you should at least give credit where credit is due. But anyway, moving on from that, Turing Machine is going to be a game about well, more or less very simple Turing machine type op operations about the sort of proto-computer programming logic operations that involve that. It's going to be in involving interesting little cards that you slip into a sleeve and try to figure out logical operators. Anyway, I'm looking forward to giving it a try, even though puzzles aren't my thing. The construction looks fascinating. And I am generally a fan of the output of Scorpion Masque, even though Decrypto is not necessarily my bag. So that is Turing Machine. Expected to be published later this year. So Reiner Knitsch's drive to have over 50% of the listed games on Board Game Geek drives ever onward. So there's a game that that we didn't talk about from last year. It's called Into the Blue. And this is a, like a push-your-luck dice game by a French publisher called Funny Fox. And coming out early this year, there's going to be a game called Longboard by 25th century games where it's sort of like a tile laying game. You're trying to build the longest board and the most boards and there'll be stickers on the boards that will, ha will have to do with, with uh, scoring seems a little light, but the other one is San Francisco being put out by rebel studios. And it seems much more interesting. You're like replanning San Francisco. It's a, another tile, you know, urban planning game. Hopefully it is a little heavier, Looking forward to trying all of these out and seeing Reiner Knizia hit 5,000 games. <laughs> Finally from us, a little bit of So Far Wrong About Games news. You may have noticed, if you pay attention to any of our media, we have changed our logo. We have an updated logo for the first time in uh, since we launched the podcast. And what does this mean? Well, that means that in the medium term, there was going to be merch, Walker. Not yet. We will let you know in more detail, but merch is incoming. We say this because people asked for it. We are usually the last to clue into what people want. So when people harass us for, I don't know, maybe two years, we might get around to doing it because such is our level of dedication and such is our level of ambition. But there's some stuff in the works. I, we will let you know when it is available. Of course, I, for one, am pretty excited. Some of it seems pretty great. So watch for future merch. And that is the news and why it does not matter. Now, on to our feature game, which is Batoku. Batoku was designed by Herman P. Millan. It was published by Devere Games last year. 
Uh, Carman Pimian is the designer of Kingdom Defenders in 2018, which won a number of Spanish awards. He also published Orb Hunters and Trente Monedas. And Devere is the same company that was behind 2020's Red Cathedral by Isra C. and Shea S., which is a game that we reviewed some time ago. Walker, why don't you give us an unhelpful summary about what you do in Batoku? In Batoku, you're forcing the old use of spirit out by polluting the river with plastic, stealing his crystals, pushing the guardian yokai spirits into retirement, conducting some sort of unnatural ritual by forcing a dragonfly and mitama spirits to do some unholy merger. Also, you can export his forest into some real estate venture. I don't think... I don't remember much of that. Um... Do you push dice across a river, Mark? Yes. Do they lose pips? Where do you think those pips go? Do you think those pips just disappear? I hadn't thought of it. It's people like you that are the problem, Mark. Clearly I'm a naive about the loss of pips. So, in Batoku, you have tons of early choices. Which or when of your cards to upgrade or retire, when to get into the real estate market, acquiring income tiles before it becomes pointless and then you have constant problems throughout the whole game you have disappearing action spaces maintaining your resource pool constantly upkeeping your dice making sure you have servants available to use whenever you need them and then lots of end game choices which are different as well finding yokai cards and stones that synergize together getting good at ticket to ride and making sure you did the travel that you needed to do. <laughs> well, we can clarify the ticket to ride later, but one thing I'd just like to stress right up front is I actually have a fair degree of difficulty keeping the different touchstones of Japanese folklore separate in the context of the theming of the game. Last week I made an offhand crack about how Botoku was Spanish for Orientalism, and clearly I wasn't too bothered about it because I didn't then, then elaborate. But this is just a sort of reimagining of basically Princess Mononoke without any of the humans involved. The Great Spirit looks exactly like it did in that movie. The various elements of Japanese folklore are sprinkled here, there, and everywhere without any real sense of thoroughgoing consistency, but it's folklore, so I'm not going to get up in arms about it. And yeah, there are yokai cards, and batoku cards, and kodama, and mitama, and, and uh, I can't remember what the dragonflies are called other than dragonflies. And I can't even remember what your dice are called, as an, as an example. I've been playing a lot of batoku recently, and when I explain the game, I don't tend to use the proper terminology... <laughs> I was about to say the same thing. When explaining the game, I'm afraid they get intermixed quite often, and it's just those things, unfortunately, sometimes. Yes. The only time when it's really useful is when it is necessary to differentiate the different kinds of cards. But I have generally found in my experience that the players that I play the game with aren't going to remember the difference between a Batoku and a Yokai card any better than I am, and so I just have to just point to the to type of back in question, and then they'll be able to figure it out. Uh, and, of course, the Kodama in particular, even if I would tell them over and over to call them Kodama, they are clearly radishes or turnips, and so that is invariably what people end up calling them. Clearly. This being said, we've just announced tons of spirits. Well, guess what? This means there's tons of tiles, tons of cards, and the setup for this game is quite ridiculous <laughs> because there are multiple piles of all these tiles. There's like four different decks of cards. There's dozens. This is not any exaggeration. There are dozens of different inserts that you have to in, uh, slide into the board depending on how many players you're playing. Uh, the setup is no joke. I will say this though in its defense. So this is, this is for, for context sake, very squarely in the wheelhouse of your medium heavy contemporary Euro game. You know, think a lot of the output of Alexander Pfister. Think about some of the heavier output of some of the French or Italian game designers. Think about a lot of the things uh, that are not quite as heavy as something that Vital Lacerda would put out, but definitely heavier than what a lot of Reiner Knizia would put out. So yes, there's lots of different components, lots of different ways to score points, very much in the felled Fister kind of design school of, of Eurogames. In terms of the setup, though, it is superficially daunting, but the virtue is, again, Unlike a lot of Fister games, you don't have to worry too much about the composition of any of these stacks of tiles. It's not like, well, if you're playing with three players, remove these following tiles and then set them out. Or if you're playing with blah, 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 blah. It's very much the kind of thing that while the person who knows how the game works is wrestling with the board inserts, which won't take too, too long, you can very easily just hand a bag to somebody and say, shuffle all these tiles. 
They don't need to know anything about them yet. Just before the rules explanation begins, you spend the minute or so setting things up. Just divvy up the components, all the different players, and say, shuffle this when you're done, shuffle that when you're done, shuffle that. It's true. And I think there's a huge ramp up to the rules explanation, a huge barrier. But as as soon as you get going, the actual actions that you take are very straightforward. There is a ton of symbology. You want symbology? Well, we got the symbology here. But once you understand what it means, I think the game is very straightforward and easy to play and flows very well as well. Uh, I, I agree. I found Batoku very pleasing in terms of how surprisingly focused it was in terms of the gameplay itself. And indeed, when explaining the rules of the game, I actually focus on how simple your turns are in terms of the options that you have available. And this is simple not because it's straight forward or obvious, or that most of the complexity is taken up by procedures that are out of your hands, but it's just that your control over the game is based primarily on a very transparent set of operators that you can do. You can place a card, place a die, or migrate the die over the river. That is pretty much it. Them's your options. And mostly when I, once the game starts, as you say, the questions that I get are about some of the iconography and some of the somewhat strange graphic design choices. There are a small number, maybe a moderate number, depending on who you ask, of poor graphic design choices. For example, the crystal tiles, uh, the difference between the pink and the purple crystal tiles is of subtle rules difference, but they're very difficult to differentiate visually. There's some strange confusion about where to be able to build what building spots, about the fact that most of the worker placement spots are south of the river, but there's actually four sp- placement spots that are north of the river, and so there's not a good formalism there. Anyway, it's not crippling, and it's not a serious barrier to the game, uh, but it is perhaps one of the most significant obstacles during play. So the fact that it's relatively minor is a testament to how smoothly flowing the game is. True, and the, and the size of the board, if someone like is looking at pictures of Botu- Botoku, you see this giant board, and it looks like there's a ton going on, but half of the board is just a placeholder to hold all these tiles and cards, and not actually, well, it is used for gameplay, but it's not, you know, worker placement areas or action spaces, it's just a place to put the tiles. Absolutely. And it's very, very much point salad. It is squarely in a point salad type of area, in that there are a lot of different ways to score points, and the scoring at the end of the game is a multi-step process that you have to follow by the list on the included and very excellent player aids. But despite that, I didn't mind going back to Botoku several times leading up to this review, because, as I say, despite the fact that it's point salad, it's not really a whole bunch of weird disconnected sub-mechanisms. It's not like, oh, okay, well, you're going to get some points from this thing, which is set collection. And, oh, okay, you're going to get some points over here, which is based on triangular scoring. You're going to get some points over here based on a mandala. You're going to get some points over here based on tracks. There's a little bit of that, but not nearly to the same extent as you might find in a lot of other contemporaries of similar weight. And as a result, I'm able to focus a lot more on, again, what I am doing and how I am interacting with the action spaces. Yeah, I have a line here too. Like it's it's a little bit like coffee traders. There is a couple of tracks too far in Botoku, Botoku, like you said earlier, like the radish track or the Kadama track, whatever you want to call it, could be eliminated completely. I think, and and nothing would be lost. Even the Botu, Botoku cards themselves is yet another track that you know could arguably be done away with as well. Huh. Well, I'll, I'll agree with you about the turnips and the radishes because I wanted them to be more consequential, actually, when, when playing the game because it's an area in Botoku of direct player competition where you're both competing up these tracks. It's basically an area majority score, scoring system. Whoever's highest on the track is going to get some number of points at the end of the game. But whoever's highest up the track might get five points and whoever's second on the track is going to get three points and just being on the track at all might give you a point in a three or two player game and as a result I didn't feel like there was a lot of cutthroat competition there and so it was a bit deflating so I agree with you you could probably excise that portion of the game entirely from Botoku but the element of the actual Botoku cards the eponymous Botoku cards where you're making this track along your own board and you might be marching your piece along it that I actually quite liked because it interfaced with one of the key traits offs at Botoku that I very, very much appreciate. And those are tempo considerations. And that is also where you get a lot of the direct player interaction as well. You have tempo considerations with respect to placement, about when and how you're going to cross the river, or even if. Amulet pressure from placement needs. You know, you desperately need to be able to place something at a high number, but you don't have the amulets yet, so you have to work out the timing for that. And getting your Botoku trail up to snuff is the kind of thing that you can always feel like you have time to do later, but then you're staring down the barrel of having to do it and not having enough time to do it, or 
having actions which are less powerful than they could be because you haven't spent the energy to make your Batoku trail as good as it could be. And I was feeling that most acutely, actually, in some of my later games. The idea that, oh, I really need to get a couple of Batoku cards, but everything else just looks so much more immediately apparently useful. And I sincerely regretted that in rounds four and five of the game because... I had all these travel points that I couldn't use as well as I could have if I had spent the time developing my Batoku cards. Yeah, that covered a couple of my next lines. I like, I really like the fact that there's a sense of you can control the board. Like you're keeping pressure up on the spaces. You're, you can keep your dice high, which keeps players out, or you can keep your, your, your dice there, forcing other people to worry whether or not you're going to cross the river or not, forcing their play. I love that. And just like I said, there is a mixture of two types of blocking because not only are you blocking space to the action, you could be putting high dice out there because they don't get to do the action of the space if they don't put out a die that's equal or two or higher than your die. They get to do the building action, but they don't get to do the main action of that space. And I thought that was very interesting. And to pick up on a point that I made last week, you're never rolling these dice. There's no arbitrariness in in terms of the strength of the worker that you're placing. It's all strictly deterministic based on how many resources you've been able to spend in terms of improving and then maintaining your dice, because generally speaking, they do degrade. And yes, that plays into the tempo very neatly and in terms of the pressure that you're exerting on other players and about how you need to react to what other players are placing. I felt that that was a great bit of, I would probably say, indirect player interaction. It's got that fantastic mechanism where if you can just hold on, if you can just do some other actions, there's a chance that that person will vacate that spot, move across the river, and then suddenly you can get into that spot. I really like that mechanism as well. A lot of other games do it. Yeah, sometimes you want to go fast. Sometimes you really want to load up on powers and abilities that let you get your dice out onto the board really quickly. Maybe because your dice are weak and you know you can't compete, so you want to get there first, so you're able to take take, uh, the action before you're blocked out of it. And or because you need to cross the river real quick to get access to something. Sometimes you need to delay, as you say, because you figure that although there's no space available yet, there will be soon because someone's going to be tempted to vacate the space by crossing the river. Again, lots of subtle tempo interactions that go on in Botoku. I'm a sucker for good tempo manipulation in a Euro game, and I think Botoku has it in spades. So we touched on the theme. It's the actual theme is the great four spirit is retiring and you're sort of vying to take his spot. Yeah, so instead of trying to impress some European potentate, you're trying to impress the great spirit of the forest. Six of one, half a dozen of the other, as far as I'm concerned. And I didn't really feel that in any of the gameplay. I knew that you were trying to get the highest score to show that you were the greatest spirit, but the actual gameplay itself, I didn't see anything that was that was sort of showing that I was doing these steps. Like even like yeah. the phase tracker was very much window dressing, going through the seasons, which just very much plays into the, that that type of folklore that it's trying to encompass, right? The four different seasons is very prevalent in, in that type of setting. And it was, some of it was very silly. It's like, okay, uh, spring, okay, move the turn marker. Okay, fall. You know what I mean? It was yeah, very- it's utterly ridiculous. There's this beautiful season tracker marker, lovely piece of wood, great sculpt, great screen printing on it. And as you say, in spring, you advance, you readjust the turn order. And then in summer, you take all your actions and then fall happens and you do a single thing. And it's so bizarre. I, I would neglect to touch it for much of the game, much of the time. And then there's the servants. I liked everything about the servants. There's a constant pressure to make sure you have enough of them because it could come up uh, when it's even not even your turn, that you'd suddenly have to have one. There's two different ways they can travel. We talked about one along the Butuko Trail along the bottom of your board, and then the whole top of the main board, there's these paths that you can go down that you can go to gates or towers that give you all sorts of different uh, abilities or that you need to score cards at the end. There's uh, places you can put them down on the bottom of your board for stone scoring, which is a very big part of the end of the game. There's uh, when you... Uh, so when you take tiles and stuff, they unlock more servants, which get you victory points at the end. And then you can even sacrifice the servants to unlock a die because like we said, it's a worker placement. So some spaces are very important to get early and you can't even play a die until you unlock them. So if you quickly sacrifice a servant servant and get them out there early, I don't think it's ever happened in any of the games that I've played, but it is an option and I found it pretty interesting. I have seen it happen once. But admittedly, in 
one game I played, I neglected to remember that it was a thing you're allowed to do until very nearly the end of the game anyway. So that's probably on me. Uh, you say servants. I uh, For a moment, I didn't even know what you're talking about. Then I remember eyeball dudes. Eyeball dudes. Eyeball dudes. It's not your fault, Mark, because it's it's on their player board. So if they didn't see, the iconography is, is quite self-explanatory. <laughs> it is there. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's not. True. And this is much like Scythe. If, if once you get to know the iconography, everything is there and it will explain to you. So let's talk about the dice. Like we just talked about unlocking them. So you, you, you have this hand of cards. You're going to draw four. You're going to pick three because you're only technically going to play three on your card. Sorry. You're technically only going to play three on your turn. You could draw more cards. That will give you more choices to play, but you're still only going to play three on your turn. Playing a card unlocks a die. Now suddenly you can put that die out on the board. And then once that die is on the board, then it can cross the river. We've talked about the way, two different ways they can block dice. And you have to upkeep the dice because when they cross the river, they're going to downgrade by one pip. And if they're a six, they're going to go all the way down to a three, which is very bad. So lots of cool timing and tempo considerations, which we've already talked about. I, I am a sucker for dice worker placement, and I like everything how they do that. I also really like how there's a very minor element of deck building, but it can really pay good dividends, because one of the things that happens at the end of the round is, of the three cards you've played, you can retire one of them. And they'll have scoring conditions all along the bottom. And they tend to feed into what the card actually does, uh, but not always in a direct way, but very often at least in an indirect way. And so if you're constantly acquiring cards that help play to a certain strength, then chances are excellent you'll be able to retire them for a large degree of points. It encourages a certain degree of specialization, not necessarily pigeonholing yourself into doing only one thing, but it really helps you think about when to acquire cards and am I going to be using exploiting this primarily for its use or am I going to be retiring this next round? I appreciated the fact that it was another avenue of specialization, which is helpful in a game with so many different ways to score points. So they're going to ask Mark, why cross the river if down? Like, why do it? Why don't cross the river if downgrades your dice? <laughs> then don't do it. Well, it's very important to cross the river because this is how you get these Botoku cards and how you get these cards to add to your deck. So it's very powerful action. So it's very important to be the first one to get there. And there's also, so there's three different things you, you can get there, the two different types of cards, and then there's a space where you can do uh, four different actions, pick any two of them as long as they're not the same. And that's putting the servants down at your scoring stones and moving your Kadama, doing all sorts of things there. So they're very powerful actions. So you can see why it's important to A, do that, and B, block the spaces so other people can't get there. And then there's the weird interaction of the dragonflies and the minima spirits. I'm actually surprised that I don't get players more confused about this, because it's one of those areas that seems arbitrary. I just explained it in terms of a taxi service. There are matama spirits. When you get them, you immediately get whatever benefit they have. But you only get the benefit on a dragonfly spirit if they can match up to a Matama and then go off to the side. So there's a weird, weird asymmetry there. There's also a strange asymmetry in terms of how they're purchased. But again, I mean, the, the game works relatively smoothly enough despite the, the number of rules, and so people tend to catch on to it re reasonably quickly. And, you know, it's more resources to be had, more source of benefits, standard point salad type stuff, but with an interesting little bit of asymmetry there about whether you want a dragonfly or whether you want a spirit. Then the buildings. So there's an interesting mix of buildings. Like we said, when you go to a, an action space, you get to do the main action. There are like, uh, there are, I believe, four to five different actions you can do depending on the value of your die. And then there are, there could be an array of buildings underneath the action spot. And if your die is high enough, you can engage one of the buildings. And if the building belongs to another player, then they get a minor benefit. Also, putting your buildings out unlocks a bunch of victory points that are on your board. And so there is a, there is a little bit of decision space because sometimes those benefits that you're giving to other players are, are not nothing. So there's a, like, do I want, is this worth taking and giving this other player, you know, more resources or victory points? I don't know. The buildings struck me as kind of an afterthought in that when I was building a building, I would usually not particularly care about what kind of building it was other than the suit of the building. Usually if I'm going to build a building, it's for the end game points. 
So I just care about what color it is. I'm going to slap it down wherever it's going to fit. And then usually when I'm placing a die, it's I'm not placing a die for the building effect. I'm placing the die for the actual space effect, and then I'll just pick a building as an afterthought. I mean, it's fine. It's good. It, it, again, it's reasonably smooth and reasonably straightforward, but I, I didn't think that it paid off to a particular advantage. I, I I liked how I really saw the design work in the buildings. You could see that they weren't just randomly suited. Like, particular buildings that gave a benefit would not be a water building, so you could see where it could not be teamed up with a certain action space. And I thought that was pretty interesting. That's fair. And then there's the vision cards, the ticket to ride cards. So these are, you're going to start with one at the beginning of the game and they'll just give you sort of like a, a direction to go. They'll say by the end of the game, you have to have a merged dragonfly and a couple of stones or, you know, a varied goals. But then near the end of the game where either A, there's no more places to build or you can't think of anything else to do, you're pretty well just drawing off this deck and trying to ticket to ride victory points that you've already obtained the stuff for. It's like, oh, six points because I just happen to have the stuff I need. Yeah, I, I didn't mind that element too much. I think that for the most part, it was, first of all, we're talking about six points or four points in a game where the end game score is going to be well in excess of 100. And parenthetically, at this point, I might as well note, we'll talk about components more in a second, I have no doubt. But Botoku has the most ridiculous plus 100 point marker I have ever seen in any game thus far. But the you were basically being rewarded for having diversified at that point. And it's not easy, usually, to get those kinds of spirit card, those vision cards. And so I didn't mind that very often near the end of the game, people would be drawing cards they could just satisfy with work they've already done. Then there's the traveling actions. We've talked about traveling down the Botuku track. What it does is gives you uh, resources. And at the end of the game, I shouldn't say because it doesn't really have anything to do with traveling, but the trail itself, there it comes in all sorts of different colors. And the more colors that you have, there's like a linear scoring track. And then at the top, it could do with your uh, with your uh, vision cards that you have to get to certain gates or certain towers. But there's lots of victory points up there as well. There's an interesting mechanism. Once you score a gate, you get to start from that gate with your next servant and travel down the path. And to cross a certain bridge, you've had to go down a certain number of spaces on the Botoku track. I thought the way they interacted was well. It was like sort of like sort of like a side quest or like an interesting thing to do on your turn. I really enjoyed the traveling. Then there's the stones. What do you think about the stones in general? You get one stone at the beginning of your game, and this is sort of like a multiplier. You have this sort of rock garden at the bottom of your board, and you're surrounding the rocks with servants. And depending on how many servants you have around the rock, it's a multiplier of whatever the condition is on the stone. It serves as, as you said last week, another way to guide players towards a certain set of strategies. If you start with one that rewards buildings, you're probably going to try to put up buildings of a certain suit. If you have one that rewards certain kinds of Matama spirits, similarly, certain kinds of cards, similarly. So it's a way to get some degree of guidance at the very beginning of the game. But, I mean, as I say, focusing on any one element of scoring, particularly as far as the endgame scoring is concerned in Botoku, is usually somewhat difficult to do because there's just so many different ways to score points. If Botoku had had a more focused scoring system, I'd be much more positive on it than I am. I like Botoku just fine, but I think that if it had a, a, a more tightly integrated set of scoring elements... I'd be a much, much bigger fan of it. But I mean, you just over the course of the past minute run down about three or four different huge sub areas of point scoring, which I think is indicative of the modern design aesthetic that it, that it's very much a part of. Yeah. You open the box, you get a point. <laughs> then there's the home of the great, the home of the great spirit. You sort of mentioned at the very beginning, the fact that it's on the other side of the river already, yet it's played as though it's on the other side of the river and it gives you, I would say medium benefits and it dictates the turn order for the next turn. So it, sometimes it's utilized. Sometimes it is not. I'm not sure on, on how many of your planes that people were actually using those spaces. Mostly ignored. That's what I thought as well. People go there on occasion, especially in the last round of the game, because being a star player will give you three points. And so if you got nothing better to do, you might as well go and just place a die for three points. But yeah, it is it is an area of real estate very infrequently exploited. And let's talk about the variability. So in a lot of the games that we played, there was talk about 
uh, the order in which the income tiles came out. Like sometimes we would see none to the end of the game and would make them like pointless because all of the income has already happened. Whereas if you get these income tiles near the beginning of the game, then they're more of a benefit. There are gates that we've talked about at the top of the board that you travel to. There are fairly large stacks of these gates, but you're only using two of them per game. So they're going to change up. Not that they're, that's a huge variability, but then as we also, as we just talked about the stones, you're going to start with a different stone every game and that might steer you in a different path every time you play. On occasion, there's the possibility of those random draws that you talked about, the order in which various things appear on the various supplies that can put somebody in a disadvantageous position. For example, say you have a stone or a vision card or what have you that rewards a certain kind of action or a certain kind of building, and that building doesn't come up until near the end of the game, or there's a glut of other kinds of buildings, or it just so happens that all of those building areas are occupied very early on, it can happen that the things don't come out of the supplies in the order that you'd want them to. And so that area of variability is a little less satisfying. But, I mean, going back to what we said before, mostly from my sense, the, the sense of playing a different game each time is mostly emphasized by what sub-areas my scoring conditions tell me to focus on as opposed to anything else that happens on the board, for example. All right. Now let's talk about component quality. Let's take, so there's two main decks of cards. There's your yokai and there's the Potoku cards. And there could be an argument made, art is subjective, (laughs) that the Potoku cards are far superior, yet the game goes out of its way to hide the art on these Botoku cards for the entire game. It's bizarre. It's so bizarre how every element of the component setup, the layout of your board, the layout of the game board itself, the layout of other cards, serves to obscure the Botoku cards. It's so weird. And and then there's your three player pieces. You have three of them, one for the Botoku, Botoku track, one for your victory points, and one for player order at the top of the board and they're really just like blobs of wood you could show people in the book this is what your blob of wood is supposed to be and i've picked up some stickers that make those blobs way nicer because it actually shows you what they are but otherwise they don't look like anything (laughs) these are minor quibbles though in a game that is very very attractive i mean my particular elements of graphic design quibbles aside It is a very visually striking game. The board is very colorful. It provides a very, very nice overview of what's going on. I find it's usually more pretty than functional, but it's not like it's not functional at all. And overall, the quality and quantity of components is nothing to sneer at. Yeah, and all the tiles are a different shape. The dragonfly and the matisma things that we've (laughs) talked about actually (laughs) walk together. I shouldn't say that because it sounds like a puzzle. They don't locked they fit together how's that all of these things look amazing on the board i like it it also has a solo mode mark like a dedicated solo mode not just you know try to get the highest score i haven't tried it but just saying for those people who enjoy solo games it does have a dedicated solo mode well it's a medium heavy euro game published in the last two years of course it's got a solo mode there you go and to wrap up if the game if after you've done a game you are always constantly, well, had I, if I had just done this at the beginning or had I just done this, had I got these building out sooner, had I upgraded my dice a little better, had I, you know, upgraded my deck at the beginning instead of doing this. If you have constantly having these thoughts, I think this is what leads to a game being very good. I would compare this favorably to a game by someone like Vladimir Suki and unfavorably to a game by somebody like Uwe Rosenberg. Now, what I mean by this is, after playing Botoku for the first time, I thought this was very enjoyable, an interesting experience, but there's a lot of point salad going on. Is this the kind of thing where it's a one and done? I've played it once. I don't really feel the need to go back to it, like a lot of Vladimir Suki designs. And I was su- pleasantly surprised and very pleased in my subsequent playings two, three, four times again that Botoku felt sufficiently different and sufficiently engaging that I didn't feel like it was just a, a one and done or a couple of plays and then we're done to be cycled through an endless churn of the hobbyist Eurogamer. On the other hand, I don't get those same satisfying sense of sandbox that I get from some of the Uwe Rosenberg worker placement games, like in A Feast for Odin, like in Agricola, like even in Caverna for what it's worth, where I get to do different things 
that feel very different. And I get to feel like I'm messing around with lots of interesting subsystems and that I've built something of consequence. At the end of the day, I still just feel like I got this card, which is worth two points, and I got this tile, which is worth three points, and it's got an extra bonus for this other thing, and that's why I wanted the red one as opposed to the blue one. So I very much think that Potoku has replay value and it's got some legs, but at the end of the day, it is not anything earth-shattering, and I think that although it is a very, very good point salad game with some interesting player interaction, but not enough, it definitely doesn't emerge from the shackles of a genre to be anything more. 100% agree with all of your points. I will be keeping it and gladly play it anytime. Well, that's going to do it for this week. Thank you very much for joining us for So Very Wrong About Games. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find our website at sowronggames.com slash contact. You'll find the various ways you can reach out to us. We read everything you send us, and we will get back to you if we can. Thanks again for tuning in, and we hope to see you again soon. Peace! You've been listening to So Very Wrong About Games, produced by Michael Walker and edited by Mark Bigney. Special thanks goes to What Does It Eat for generously allowing us to use their most excellent song, FOS, as our theme. You can find them at whatdoesiteat.com. You can reach us by email at soverywrongaboutgames at gmail.com or on Twitter at sowronggames. Thanks very much. See you next time. And always, try to be right, but remember you are so very wrong. Hello, dear listeners, once again from Masterpiece Theatre. In honor of His Grace, Professor Dr. Dr. Vincent, Duke of Diesel, Esquire OBE. This week we will be discussing the Netflix series, All of Us Are Bored. I mean, All of Us Are Dead. Walker, what do you have to say about this? Well, I watched the whole series, Mark. It is a Korean zombie high school movie. So you've got your triangular love affairs being eaten by zombies. It's, uh, I believe, 43 episodes, average length of 82 minutes each. But don't worry, they only feel like they're 100 minutes long. Is there that many? Good lord. <laughs> no. Walker, this is what we okay. call a, a joke. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, I know I watched a lot, but that seems like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very much Game of Thrones. Mark's only watched a couple episodes, but it's very Game of thrones as you don't know who they're going to kill. They had this whole... Mark might touch on it. I'm not sure this whole series of, of the main character's mother and how he, she adored him. She named the whole restaurant after him and she finds out that there's this commotion at the school. She has this motorcycle scene where she's evading cops and, and ducking away from spoilers ahead, ducking away from zombies. And then out of nowhere, bam, she's a zombie. You know, the whole thing, you know, normally I'd say, oh, what's the point of this whole subplot? But it's that's the thing you just don't know. And there's several instances of this where you think it's a main character, boom, dead. Love that part of the show. So I watched the first episode and I observed that the show was about three things. High schoolers' relationships, food, and zombies. And the first two things I thought were great. I'm more than happy to listen to characters talk about takbaki and Korean fried chicken all day long. That's A-OK. All the zombie stuff bored me to tears. And then the second episode started, and it was just zombie stuff. And I did not care. At all. And the action was tepid. And I thought, yeah, I mean, lots of people die. Lots of main characters die. But in scenes that I did not engage me in the slightest. No, there was a couple good scenes. There was... There was, there's a whole side, side plot of the guy who invented this virus and how, you know, his, he was bullied and his, his son was bullied and that was awfully painful to watch. But they could the stuff have, with, they could have done that. Look, if they wanted to make this a drama movie, uh, about, you know, various goings on and it could have been any number of conspiracies or weird side research you could have done, that was fine. But, like, honestly, for one thing, I'm a little bit tired of zombies, and I don't think this show did anything novel with them. And it's just, in the first episode especially, every time they would cut to the science teacher and the whole thing about him looking dodgy and, oh, and he smells like a corpse, and do you know why he smells like a corpse? Well, because this 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 girl in high school, I, I, I'm not making this up, I just, I thought it was so hilarious that I had to make a note of it. She knows all the smells in the world, 
except for one smell, because she's never smelled a rotting corpse. So she smelled this guy, and he didn't know what he smelled like, so he had to be smell like a rotting corpse. Well, that's, that's, that's Sherlock that Holmes deduction she, right she, there, man. She knows all the smells in the world but one. This is what the show says. I could Anyway, this is not a criticism of the show. I just thought it was well, hilarious. It, Maybe this it is could have been a translation yeah. thing. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to know what, what the actual line was, but <laughs> who knows? That's just it. So this is a Netflix production. They, uh, they've been bringing over Korean shows a lot, and even more so since the success of Squid Game. This isn't even the first Korean zombie drama they've brought over, because there was the historical Korean zombie drama Kingdom, which they brought over, Watched an episode of that a few years ago. Thought it was incredibly boring as well. And there was a whole bunch of criticism about Squid Game's translation. About how the subtitles were questionable. About how they were much too figurative. I, I don't know a whole heck of a lot of, uh, uh, about the Korean language. But I do know that they have a, a large number of honorifics and patronyms and a whole bunch of things like that. That have not been rendered in the sub. I wish they would just give us a primer on the various pronouns and honorifics that are employed in Korean and then just put them in the subtitles. The way they have to translate around those things always irks me in any language that has them. But now I think, uh, so I, I don't know how accurate these subtitles are. I mean, they're perfectly legible and so forth. I just don't know what relation they have to the actual text. I did, they did do the thing where they do an interesting literal translation of negative questions because in English, negative questions are a source of ambiguity. And in uh, both Korean and in Japanese, they're dealt with slightly differently anyway. But that, that, that's a bit of a digression. So it was watchable for me. I like the, the trust issues that the people had, like where when they thought someone was turning into a zombie or when, when student A was about to be eaten and then pushing her best friend in the way to be eaten by a zombie. All of those scenes were sometimes interesting. So overall, it got kind of repetitive near the end and much that I like in Japanese anime it 12 and done would have been the best scenario. It goes on a little bit too long. Kind of interesting. I think it went on way too long, even in the first episode. Have you seen Train to Busan? I did. There's supposed to be a uh, a movie that came after that one as well. Yeah, I, I heard. I, I don't know where care. Watch Train to Busan instead if you want to watch Korean zombies. Agreed. It was amazing as well. Next up, I will be making sure Mark watches Hit Monkey because it is fantastic. Uh, Walker, you don't get to tell make me watch media anymore. I would just like to point out that the the ratio of, of things you make me watch. <laughs> <laughs> man, you made me go through the whole Fast and the Furious series. You get to say nothing. No, nah, man, that wasn't that was the listeners. That wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my bright idea. Thank you very much once again for joining us for Masterpiece Theater in honor of His Grace, Professor Dr. Dr. Vincent Earl of Diesel, Esquire, OBE. See you again later. Bye-bye.